Hello, this is Dr. Scott Catino, and I'm providing this brief video lecture on the Iran threat. Um, this is obviously a major area of security studies uh, that centers on Iran's intentions and abilities, I should say capabilities, to threaten the United States, its allies, its partners, and uh, countries in not only the region but around the globe. It has gained a lot of attention. And I, it's a subject I would like to explore today, but rather than, than creating an extensive argument for or against the concept of the Iran threat, what I'd like to do is just introduce the subjects of how Iran, or the, rather the methods and the strategy that Iran uses to threaten the United States or those it deems its, its enemies. And I'm hoping that this will provide just a further inspiration and stoke the interest of students at Henley Putnam University to look deeper into any one of these issues or to look at them more comprehensively. So this video lecture is admittedly going to try to give a very broad perspective and skim the surface so we can understand the contours, the scope, and the distance that Iran is going um, in its that is pursuing rather in its strategy against the United States and its allies and partners. If we take a quick look here at the threats, we see that they're quite broad. Everything from a nuclear threat to diplomatic threats to proxy wars, conventional arms, acts of terrorism, EMP potential attacks, cybersecurity issues and attacks, and political ideology and information operations used to undermine the United States and its interests. These are all particular threat areas that have been assessed and that are important to look at and really are, are subjects in their own right. So let's just take a look at these and begin to broach the, the arguments for these, these topics and allow students then to make up their own minds and look a little deeper into these particular subject areas. The nuclear threat is so important. Obviously, so many people are concerned about Iran's nuclear capabilities, or rather their development of nuclear weapons. And for people that aren't following this, the information seems to be uh, really con conflictive. We see Iran denying, at times asserting it as the right to develop nuclear weapons, at other times saying that it doesn't. Uh, the, the inspectors that go in from the International Atomic Energy Agency are very clear to say that R Iran is does have an intention to do so, has taken steps in this direction. Um, you can read those reports for yourself. So verification becomes an issue. Other people are more concerned about Iran developing uh, weapons, obviously, that have the capability to carry nuclear weapons. There seems to be a lot of reporting on this. And the argument goes that if Iran is not interested in weaponizing a nuclear uh, device, then why is it obviously pursuing this and developing these capabilities? So deliverability is a major issue. And this is something that's of extraordinary concern to Israel. It's, you know, there's so much misconception about the subject of Israel and, and its perception of a threat from Iran, particularly in, in nuclear weapons. Many Americans remember Ahmadinejad, the president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, pictured in the forefront here in his statement that Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth and see that as a major statement made by this individual and one that portents possible genocide, particularly stated against a, a nation that has experienced it in the, in the 20th century. You know, obviously, uh, is, a, is a, a horrible scenario to contemplate and one that concerns Israel, but it's really far more acute and sensitive than that. The fact of the matter is that statement was not an off-the-cuff statement made. It's not singular in its, in its appearance. There have been similar statements made consistently across decades by senior leaders within the Iranian government and military to that regard. And the fact that Israel is constantly portrayed in Iranian press and in propaganda and in media as being vermin, as being animals, as being lower than animals, and terms of extermination are used, and particularly statements uh, made by 
uh, Iranian leaders and, and people obviously of influence stating that if Israel is wiped off the face of the map, that Iran will then chase down the Jews throughout the world to kill them. And this is, this is obviously an intent and statements that are a tremendous concern for Israel. But even for those of us in the West who are concerned that even if Iran would get a nuclear weapon, it would be very dangerous, increasingly dangerous, if it wouldn't even use them. The fact of the matter is that if Iran would have a nuclear weapon, they could potentially check the conventional forces of, the, of militaries in their region or even the United States that, that could respond to their aggression. And by doing so, that would throw the conflict down to the low intensity level, to the asymmetrical ground level where Iran excels. And that could be their very intention, to gain a nuclear weapon and then not to use it, to use it as a threat, thus shaping the battle space favorably to them and their asymmetrical forces. Others have added that if Iran had nuclear capability, they could not only check conventional forces, they would then be able to use that increased security to continue to be a sanctuary for terrorists, international terrorists, as they have done. And people call attention to the fact of Osama bin Laden fleeing Afghanistan in the aftermath of the initial operations of, of OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom, and then going to Iran. So these are all scenarios that emerge around the nuclear issue, and the nuclear threat is indeed a subject in and of itself. Okay, let's move along. Now, diplomacy is important to understand that diplomatically, Iran's ambassadors and diplomatic efforts are, are, are very aggressive, and oftentimes the forward presence of Iranian diplomats really are, are nothing more than a forward presence of their, of their military and terrorist operations. And their embassies often operate in this regard. Uh, people are very concerned about this, who, who observe Iran and see their diplom diplomacy not only used to undermine the United States and its interests, to leapfrog U.S. sanctions, its increasing global reach and partnership, being used to spread terrorist organizations, creating bases of operations. And many people have called attention to the 2011, 2011 alleged Iran assassination plot, as it's called, the Iran assassination plot or Iran terror plot, it's called in the media. This was an extraordinary event and one very openly where uh, Iranian special forces called the Quds Force were recruiting, uh, recruited actually an Iranian American to carry out an assassination plot simultaneously uh, designed to kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington while he was at a restaurant that he frequents, and also then to blow up to attack the Saudi embassy in the United States. And m many such activities like this are found and linked to the diplomatic efforts of Iran, and it's something very, very important to understand. So the diplomacy itself, its ability to move globally and to act in such a malign hostile manner is something that is a concern to the United States and its allies. Now, the use of proxies and creating proxy wars throughout the region and even globally is important. Iran has a long history. That is to say, uh, the Iranian Islamic uh, revolutionary regime that is currently in power has a long history of creating proxy groups and often through Shia communities that are penetrated and then radicalized, leaders being trained, uh, clerics being trained in Iran at their camps and their, their seminaries and then sent back to countries and creating, creating insurgencies. The case of Lebanon is obviously one that has come to attention historically. The Shia communities of southern Lebanon, which were a part of that state, were mobilized, were radicalized, were... Um, Shia clerics trained in Iran and partnered with Iran were uh, mobilized, activated, and inserted into various organizational apparatuses that stretched that part of the country. And as a result of that, there's not only uh, a militant movement that affects the area and the region, the Levant, with attacks on Israel, it's far more than that. Hezbollah, that organization that is 
funded, supported, and directed by Iran, has become an international threat. And much the same could be said about Bahrain, where from the, the rise of the Iranian regime in 1979, the Iranian government has worked very hard to stir up unrest and to mobilize the Shia community using partners. It doesn't have to use it directly. It's far more sophisticated than that. It's able to use Shia clerics, domestic clerics from Bahrain that were trained like Ali Salman and Sheikh Issa Qasim, for instance, who organize the resistance against the Al Khalifa monarchy, monarchy in Bahrain. And we see even as, er, even as recent as December of 2013, an Iranian arms shipment was interdicted um, trying to smuggle arms into Bahrain to the Shia opposition and to terrorist cells that exist there today. So Iran has a major part in this. It need not have operational control. Uh, it simply needs to be able to stir up, to agitate, to arm, to support, to train, it need not have direct operational control, although sometimes it does that. For those of us who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, we know that, for instance, in southern Iraq, without Iranian support, funding, training, and at times Iranian Quds forces had operational control over the so-called Shia militant groups. Without Iranian support and sanctuary and all that implies, those groups in southern Iraq would have been no more than gangs. They could have been handled by local law enforcement, but their capabilities were far superior because of Iranian involvement. And many such cases could be given. You know, critics of this line of argument are quick to say, well, you know, can we really trust, and, you know, fill in the blank, the, the government of Bahrain to give us honest information? You know, we have to look at that and say it's not an, a matter of trusting the government of Bahrain or who else. That statement made by the government of Bahrain of the interdiction of Iranian arms coming in is a narrative or statement that is very commonly given, not even in the Gulf alone, but all through the Middle East, all through Europe, all through places like Cyprus, Bulgaria, Azerbaijan, the United States, Israel. Uh, there are many countries that talk about Iranian interference and Iranian subversion and Iranian terrorist activities taking place. This is certainly not a Bahrain issue or a Hezbollah Lebanon issue. It's obviously something confirmed by diverse countries around the globe. Iranian assassination attempts uh, during the 80s, I believe, when they were hunting down uh, regime dissidents, uh, the former regime loyalists to the monarchy, uh, literally carrying out assassination operations in, in France, discussed widely by Europeans. The, the, the narrative and statements are sim similar, almost identical at times, of Iranian terrorist activities and f fomenting of these proxy wars in various places to undermine regimes. So this is a well-established fact. And conventional arms are important. It's not just an issue of nuclear arms. If people who study Iran are concerned about their conventional arms, the increasing reach capabilities and political threats that could be made and are made through the use of their conventional arms. Uh, Iranian missiles are becoming more sophisticated with the longer reach, being able to reach Europe, and the Iranians are working on missiles that could reach the United States. The individuals in our country wonder what the purpose of such increased capabilities would be. And this is something that is far more than just missile technology. It, the Army, Navy, use of drones, etc are all aspects to be looked at and understood. So we mentioned some of the issues of terrorism, and there are many such examples. The, the 1983 barracks bombing, obviously, in Lebanon, and some would add the Kobar Tower. So that uh, Iran obviously uh, supports international terrorism. It states that it's its right to spread revolutionary ideology. It's mentioned in their constitution. They established an organizational appara apparatus, have postured its military, has developed and organized it with a special operations, the Quds Force, to project power with particular branches for particular parts of the globe. And, you know, here's an example of the regime here in Tehran where there's a moral praising uh, suicide bombers. It's a part of their ideology. And 
when one, one reads the radical clerics in their country, and really that, that whole line of thinking is radical, you know, and those that are considered moderates certainly are, are not moderates by our standards. They're, they may be more um, vocal in their, in their use of what they would consider soft power, but the spreading of this revolutionary ideology and using terrorism is such a major aspect of the way their, their entire polity, their entire orientation of exists. And it's a part of the culture that they try to inculcate. And that doesn't say mean all Iranians. Now, we obviously know in 2009, I believe, in 2009 and 10, when the Green Revolution took place in their country, there was widespread protest against this type of radicalization and self-destructive direction under President Ahmadinejad. And there were legitimate movements for reform. So we don't want to overstate that. And it's not to say that all Iranians or even a vast majority of. There was a huge turnout in the protests that took place. And those were systematically destroyed by the state, particularly using local forces to besiege the local militias that were formed for that very purpose. Nonetheless, terrorism is a major threat. This EMP, the electromagnetic pulse, is something that has also gained attention. And for those of you who may just be hearing this for the first time or heard it and, and do not really understand what it is, electromagnetic pulse, keeping it very basic, is the ability to use a nuclear weapon exploded in the atmosphere over a target country, let's say the United States. Such an explosion would cause a major pulse, and thus the term an electromagnetic pulse, that would have the ability to destroy the critical infrastructure, anything that runs off of ele electricity, disabling it. Now, there's just a lot of technical aspects to it, that how far that type of pulse could be projected, what's necessary to, to do that, how long it would be able, how long the disabling of an infrastructure would take place. There are a lot of questions there. The fact of the matter is this would be a very dangerous threat, and it's not science fiction. The, 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 the truth of the matter is that the Iranians have not only demonstrated interest in it, but those who study the subject in detail note that they are developing a capacity to carry this out potentially, the initial stages of this. It's more than just an interest or rhetoric, but there's some action being taken on it, and thus this area needs to be brought to the forefront of potential threats or a part of the, the wide scope of the Iranian threat. So if we could quickly review for a second and step back, you know, we look at this and say, well, truly, across the entire DIME scenario, the acronym that stands for, again, diplomacy, information, or intelligence, military, or economics, that Iran really has a very wide uh, view of how it wants to challenge its and, and how it wants to threaten and potentially wage war against its, its enemies. So we need to understand the broad view of this. And, you know, th that no one can predict how the actual future could come out. We examine these trajectories. We look at intentions. We look at how they have mobilized, how they have um, their, their force configurations, their order of battle, the type of tactics they, they have used. And we develop trajectories. And so we discuss these, these very subjects and issues we're talking about now. But let's go to cybersecurity. That's gained a lot of attention. I think this statement by the ODNI, the Director of National Intelligence and the Worldwide Threat Assessments, uh, released relatively recently, calls attention to Iran and North Korea and Russia and others as unpredictable actors in the international arena. Their development of cyber espionage or attack capabilities could be used against the U.S. to destabilize it and its partners. And there is much research on this and the distinction between espionage and attack is important to understand. But again, it's not just ideas. It's not just someone saying Iran could do this. The fact that some at attacks have taken place uh, coming from Iran, the fact that they have mobilized and organized a co military command element dealing with cyber attack is important to understand. So these aren't just mere issues being brought up and potential threats. People have called attention to this, experts in the field, because Iran has already acted on these very areas and have developed and are developing higher capabilities in this regard. So we have to be aware of it. 
And lastly, I, I call attention to political ideology. The Iranians have been very careful not to simply portray themselves as leading a Shia Islamic revolution. They have been very careful to dub their, or rather portray in their information operations, their ideology and their cause as being one of freeing not only the Shia who are oppressed, but also Muslims trying to co-opt and lead uh, Muslim dissent and movements, and also to consider themselves liberators and those just trying to aid oppressed peoples and so-called underprivileged nations who are victims of uh, allegedly American imperialism in countries even like the Soviet, uh, excuse me, Russia uh, and the UK, for instance, and France and Western interests. Uh, Iran has been very successful in being able to push that message and to gain some level of acceptance among a wider audience than merely Shia and Shia communities throughout the world and the Middle East. Now, recently there's been a setback in that, so I don't want to exaggerate this. There's been some mitigating factors. The, the uh, uprisings that, that have taken place during the um, Arab Spring have in many places morphed into a, a Sunni versus Shia conflict, and particularly in Syria, that has galvanized a lot of Middle Eastern opinion and caused a lot more suspicion of Iran to take place. So some of their ideological attractiveness has been dulled and lessened because of that, which has taken uh, place in those specific areas that I mentioned, including Bahrain, um, and there are other areas and other examples, but they still remain a, an ideological threat using information operations. And here we see, not surprisingly, Ahmadinejad, for instance, um, speaking with Fidel Castro, uh, Hamas leaders, and obviously the Shia cleric Issa Qasim in Bahrain. And if you really look at this, it's very a very broad influence, partnership, to varying degrees with these individuals. You look at a communist, an atheist communist, finding some type of affinity with Ahmadinejad. Well, where's the connection? Well, obviously, they're both very committed in fighting Western so-called imperialism, the United States and its allies, the entire and current global international order. So there's the nexus, and Ahmadinejad is able to make that connection the Shia communities, the, Iran continues to extend its reach globally and do that, even in places uh, such as the tri-border area in Latin America. And uh, let's not overlook Hamas, which makes this so extraordinary, where Hamas leaders are embracing Ahmadinejad. The, the obvious is that Ahmadinejad is Shia, representing a Shia community, and, and Hamas is Sunni. They are oftentimes arch enemies, but the fact of the matter is here we see an alliance. Here we see strong partnership, and this is to the, the credit, that's not to say approvingly, but to the credit of the capabilities indicating advanced capabilities to broaden one's reach ideologically. It's extraordinary and indicates some very potent information operations that are being used. Uh, you know, likewise, much could be said about Venezuela, and its connections to Iran, and, and this subject can be taken much, much further. Each one of these areas, in fact, uh, it's very important to understand, are subjects in their own right. But we need to step back and look at them from a very broad perspective, because using one of these or a combination of these, as the two Chinese colonels said in Unrestricted Warfare, it, it would certainly be an added dimension to the threat. And this is not hypothetical. This is something that many of us witnessed in whole or in part. I remember particularly um, when I was in Iraq, you know, there were some very, very clear open source media reports about Iranian activity on the border and at border points where they would use electrical grids that were common to the areas and literally shut them down or surge them with electricity to, to cause havoc on the other side of the border and simultaneously uh, detain the population flows, immigrants that are legally crossing the border from Iran to Iraq, and then flood them by just letting them all go at one time and using helicopters to to just hover very close to border points, creating chaos. There, there are just so many types of of unconventional 
uh, threats that if they are multiplied and used in a hybrid manner and layered that could increase the, the mass effects. This is important to understand that the Iranian threat may not indeed be one of these in particular, but could be a combination of them is the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, here's just a, another slide that I have here on the Mujahideen uh, Kalk, the, the uh, MEK, the MEK. Uh, considered to be among the most extraordinary enemies of, of Iran, the Iranians are very concerned about this dissident group that has penetrated their own borders uh, that oftentimes have the most advanced intelligence. The reason I call attention to them is, uh, please, if you get a chance, read some of their sources, read some of their websites and some of their statements. They they often very openly talk about Iranian activities, the vulnerabilities, etc. It's important to understand. Thank you very much for listening to this video lecture. Um, again, I, I appreciate the, the time that students put into these, these subject areas and the research that you're doing. And anything I can do to encourage that to help you in your research, please feel free to contact me. You have my email and many of you have my cell phone. And I would encourage you to reach out. This is something so important to see you further your studies and have a great week.